Nick Smith here, speaking to you from London. Welcome to number 13 in our series of Alpine Club casts. Tonight we're back in the Alps for some Alpine rock to remember. I really hope you enjoy it. A special welcome to Fell and Rock Climbing Club members tonight, and especially to Ron Kenyon. Congratulations to Ron on being awarded the prestigious BMC George Band Award for a lifetime of tireless volunteer work. It's great to have you with us. First tonight, Nick Simons is joining us from about 300 yards down the road from me in southeast London. In his working life, Nick is an actor who joined the Alpine Club about two years ago. He's also a member of the Swiss Alpine Club, Basel Section, and today he's going to talk about the Miroir d'Argentine, which is a giant limestone slab close to Montreux at the eastern end of Lake Geneva. It boasts a spectrum of choices for fantastic one-day endeavours. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I had wrongly imagined that not many Brits have heard of the Miroir d'Argentine, but uh, asking around, it turns out, for instance, uh, Victor has guided it many, many times. Uh, he says it's only a 90 minute drive from Chamonix. Uh, and the other day, Richard Nadin told me that he and his son have done Papageno, which is one of the harder routes on the slab there. Uh, and our own Les Swindon gave the Miroir d'Argentine very admiring coverage in the Bernese Oberland guidebook. Uh, but I might not have looked it out myself, uh, except for a family connection. Uh, my mum and stepdad uh, lived for nearly a decade in Grillon, a very ancient, beautiful village. Uh, th that was their view, or, or, or part of it. Uh, what you can see there is the Cime de l'Est of the Dent du Midi from an unaccustomed angle. Chris Bonington did a first ascent on that profile, you can see. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, anyway, for me, the connection with the Miroir d'Argentine uh, begins with a sentimental attachment. Our first visit to the grandparents uh, was when our daughter took some of her first steps. Uh, the Miroir is directly above my wife, Karen, there. Uh, let's have a quick look at the map uh, coming up. There we are. Martini is just out of sight off the bottom there in the Rhone Valley's dog leg. You can drive up to the Argentine from Bay or from Aigle. Closer in, you can see Solale more clearly. That's where you leave the car. Uh, and south, southeast of that, where Nick has kindly added an arrow, you can see the famous Miroir slab. Uh, and the Argentine's ridge is very clear too, uh, running across the center of the map. Now, I want to talk about three different routes. The traverse of the ridge across that skyline there, uh, although only about half of the uh, traverse route is visible there, uh, and two routes on the slab itself. This is the normal uh, or the Y route. It's graded difficile. Uh, you can see the distinctive fork of the Y clear in the upper pitches there. Uh, and this is the direct, also a difficile. Uh, it feels much straighter than it looks in this picture. Uh, so on that first visit, I quickly learned about this famous miroir uh, and I was desperate to get on it. But at the time, I had no climbing connections in Switzerland. My mum had made friends with this highly respectable local, that is Gabby Chaperon in her 90s there, now sadly no longer with us. She had done the South Ridge of the Dent Blanche in her 70s, uh, but at this point in her life, I think she wasn't that into doing the miroir for the umpteenth time uh, with me. Uh, it has been done by a nonagenarian. Uh, there's a YouTube video, many of you will have seen, uh, of Yves Remy, father of the famous Remy brothers, doing a sort of hybrid of the normal and the direct at the age of 93. Uh, but as for me, uh, with no other option, for the first time in my life, I decided to book a professional guide. Very luckily for me, Graham Ettel lived locally uh, because his wife was teaching at one of the nearby international schools. Uh, once a year, he would be back in Scotland guiding for the winter season, but for the rest of the year, he did all of his guiding in the Alps. Uh, very nice man, genuinely a bit of a legend, as many of you will know, full of fascinating stories and beta, uh, and it was a strangely soothing experience being guided, uh, not being allowed to lead any of it, uh, e even the very easy stuff. For instance, this is Graham on the straightforward entry pitch 
Um, it was a cold day in October and we'd had to approach up an uncharacteristic amount of snow uh, to reach it. The normal is basically a romp. It gets 5C plus, but only for one single move off the Jumbly Terrace, which is usually aided off a bolt. Otherwise, it's a joy rise. Um, my daughter's 11 now. Maybe one day soon we'll revisit Grion uh, and climb the route together. This is the ambience in the right fork of the Y, high up on the slab. as bolts every five or six metres. It feels like a posh scramble. Graham led us out on the finish that the direct takes, uh, rather than turning that head wall on the left as per the normal's route description. You have this head wall in sight for a good while uh, and increasingly it looks intimidatingly steep, but it's an optical illusion against the angle of the slab. Just a short vertical juggy passage uh, and you're on safe ground in a comfortable niche on the ridge. Down below Graham there, you can see the car park and uh, the buvette of Solale uh, and away on the horizon are the Tour d'Ai which tower over Les Ains, home of the International School of Mountaineering. Five or ten minutes exposed scrambling gets you off the ridge uh, and I recommend taking the rightmost descent below Anzans to get this viewpoint on the miroir. Uh, I think this is the only time I've ever climbed in the Alps in October uh, and the colours and the light quality were very, very special that day. The next time I was on the Argentine was to do the Traverse with my friend Kyron Cheer as part of our build up to the Matterhorn. By the way, some of the photos I want to show were taken by Kyron. This view is from the summit of the Grand Mouveron. So the miroir is out of sight uh, on the north face at the right hand eastern end of the dragon back there. You can see this is a perfect place to practice moving together efficiently because it's too low to make a meaningful dent in your acclimatization for higher ground. Uh, here's a, a winter view uh, over of the north face with the Miwa's upper portion snowed over. Uh, but unlike the ridge view from Solale, which I showed earlier, this gives a complete view of the traverse. Uh, there's the Grand Mouveron the viewpoint of that last shot showing prominently at the back. You can do the ridge traverse in either direction. We went from east to west, uh, all the time facing the Don du Midi with that Bonington first ascent, the Arete de Valère clearly in profile. There it is in the background. Uh, the route is named after John Harlin. Uh, he and Bonington and Rusty Bailey did it around the time that Harlin set up the International School of Mountaineering in 1965. Whichever direction you go in, it gets AD. Uh, there's two or three passages of 4C, 5A, half a dozen abseils, enough bolts, loads of atmosphere. It is long though. Uh, I gather the local nickname for it is the Arete de la Soif, the Thirsty Ridge. Uh, the first ascent was in 1908 uh, in the other direction of travel to the one that Karen and I took. Uh, they did it in seven hours uh, around the time Karen and I did. There was a pioneering bit of mountain filmmaking done in 1922 when Emile Gou and his team filmed a traverse over three days. Now, I can't trace this film. If anyone can, I would absolutely love to see it. This is me realizing we were an hour over modern guidebook time with the last two abseils still to go. Uh, so top mountaineering tip, if you do accept your non-climbing mum's kind offer to drop you and your friend off for a long route, best not to specify a pickup time or you might cause us some agonizing moments of thinking that you've died. Karen and me came back a couple of years later uh, and we did the direct back on the slab. Uh, here's Karen heading back from a recce the evening before. Uh, I'd remembered Graham's stories of parties blundering around before dawn, failing to find the approach. Uh, the thing is to go left across the meadow after the river crossing. Uh, you pick up an obvious trail in the top corner of that meadow. There's a scramble at the bottom of the route, which definitely focuses the mind. Uh, then there's enough room to gear up at the bottom of the actual climbing. There are four corner pitches up to the median terrace. There's a feature they call the letterbox on the third pitch, 
which uh, I didn't get any pictures of, uh, which I've blotted out any memory of. Victor warmly recalls plenteous pigeon shit, uh, which I don't remember. After the terrace, you need to choose where you commit to the slab very carefully. Uh, there isn't a detailed description in Les Swindon's book. Uh, the English page of the Camp to Camp website has some scant detail, but if you switch to the French, uh, there's suddenly a proper account of each pitch, uh, which if you need to, you could run back through Google Translate. Without that, uh, we might have got delayed and annoyed at this point. As Swindon says, the direct is much more sustained than the normal. Strangely, it gets a lower technical grade, but this is only because of that one usually aided move over on the normal. The direct feels like minimum 5A from bottom to top. Below Chiron there, you can see Solale and the meadow I mentioned where the approach trail continues from the eastern corner. Honestly, to be fair, perhaps some of the route feels a little softer than 5A. Uh, by incredible coincidence, it was always me who led those pitches. Uh, on the other hand, Chiron did an amazing job on pitches that felt pretty teetery and run out. Uh, there's natural gear here and there, as you can see, but nothing like the bolting on the normal. I've kept in this selfie Chiron got from the top of the route because it shows the perfect convex of the miroir there. Now here's the exit again where we saw Graham moving carefully through fresh October snow in that uh, earlier photo. The niche and anchors at the top of the miroir are up and left of Chiron there by that orangey wall. And you can see uh, how the whole area here is a geologist's paradise. In fact I'd say it's a paradise in general the looks on our faces here tell a pretty clear story. So there you have it. Uh, a much loved favourite of mine for a long time, my mum's home mountain, uh, a destination I can't recommend too highly. I'd, I'd say it's perfect for a, a day out while you're waiting for conditions to settle down higher up, or perhaps if you've only got one day left of your trip before you're forced to travel home. Uh, I do hope you get to climb there one day if you haven't already. Thank you very much for listening uh, and handing back to you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Fantastic. I'd love to climb that route, I must say, well, all of them, in fact. Next tonight, I'm going to talk about a couple of fantastic rock routes close to SAS. Each year, I run the Alpine Club's SAS Aspirant Meet, which, by the way, is going ahead this year. It runs for about two weeks from the 29th of August, and all members are invited to roll up at the campsite in SAS Grunt and join us informally. In 2015, I was a participant on the meet and with Tim Pearson, uh, we decided to have a go at uh, a route called the Lago Maggiore. On this map, you can see uh, the top left, the Almagella hut, and you can head up to that quite easily from Sass. And uh, from there, you go southeast, past the Middle Rook, and at the bottom of your screen, you can, you can see the Zonig Pass, which is on the border there with Italy, but Switzerland and Italy. So you head to the Zonig Pass. Uh, before I carry on, I, I can't uh, not mention the Portrangrat, which is right in the middle of your screen, actually, um, literally carving your screen down the centre. The Portrangrat, um, it was first climbed, interestingly, in 1871 by Alpine Club, well, later Alpine Club president, um, Clinton Thomas Dent. And uh, so next year will be the 150th anniversary of that climb. And actually to the day on the 7th of September, uh, the aspirant meet will be taking place. So we, we can all go and do a, a mass ascent. Uh, hopefully Victor will, will, will join us and, and, uh, and, you know, as one as, as, as he's a predecessor, uh, sorry, a successor as president. Uh, we could call it the president's climb or something. Anyway, back, back to uh, the route I want to talk about. So you come to the Zonic Pass there at the bottom of your screen, and here the ground drops very steeply away um, into Italy. And in fact, there's a, there's a, a, a Via Ferrata, a very steep ladder, which the Italians have built there. You drop down that, and the route I'm going to talk about is marked, the start is marked by the red arrow, and there is a little bivy hut, an orange bivy hut, 
uh, called the Bivacco Citta di Varese. Um, and the, the, the route, the Lago Maggiore, I don't think I actually said the name of the route, <laughs> the Aret Lago Maggiore, um, follows the ridge due west from the Red Arrow back up to the Italian-Swiss border. So I went in 2015 with a guy called Tim Pearson and um, we, we failed. We, we got to the Bivy Hut um, uh, where we spent a very pleasant evening with these uh, lovely Italians that we met there. Um, and then we had a go at the route and we got stuck and we, we, we turned around and had to climb all the way back up this very steep Via Ferrata. Um, it wasn't until three years later that I found myself back there uh, with a bit more experience this time, Natalie, Natalie Villaroel, who's a, also an Alpine Club member. And um, here we are just gearing up. And um, this is the, the start of the Via Ferrata that, that I mentioned. Um, so we drop down that. And then you probably can't quite make it out, but right at the top of your screen above Natalie's head is a little orange box. And that's the, the Bivy hut that I, that I showed you a picture of before. Um, this picture shows, again, right at the bottom right, you can see the orange box, and the ridge, Lago Maggiore ridge, follows, the, follows up, you know, up to the top left into the cloud. Here we are arriving for the second time, or me for the second time, at the, the Bivy Hut. Um, this time we had it almost to, to ourselves. Um, the Guardian was still there, in fact. This, uh, is the um, exactly the same Ebax was, was there three years later. Um, and as you can see from this picture, really quite used to um, visitors. So that was nice. Inside the hut this time, we found a, a, a nice pencil drawing of the route, um, which claims it takes four hours. It took us a wee bit longer, I must say. Um, and this is now the next morning. Uh, this is one of the most wonderful places uh, in the Alps that I've, uh, that I've stayed at, I must say. Uh, you get the most fabulous sunrise uh, directly into the front door of, of this little bivy hut. And of course, in these days of, you know, social distancing, wh where could you wish for but a, a little bivy hut, you know, just, just the two of you. Um, it's a really magnificent spot. So I urge uh, everyone to, to seek these little bivy huts out uh, this summer. This photo is taken about 8 a.m. So we basically, all you do is roll out of bed and head, or head on up the ridge. Um, three years previously, this is the point where I, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd been, um, I basically got stuck. This is a, there's a little overhang here um, and I had a bit more gear this time. Uh, so, uh, and, and perhaps a little bit more um, bravery uh, or maybe experience as well. And that helped get over this, this, uh, this overhang. Uh, and you can see the smile on Natalie's face, which is sort of reflecting my relief uh, at managing to, to, to get past that point. So on we forge, and, and after that, it's fairly easy ground, nice, lovely, open ridge, you know, typical ridge uh, moving together. Um, and it gradually gets steeper. So um, the ground gets a little bit more technical as you get higher. Um, there I am launching up. And true to form, as, as the previous time, the clouds came down and the route's actually named after, uh, well, after the Lago Maggiore. And, and I think for the reason that you get a view of the Lago Maggiore, I, I confess I, I've never actually seen it uh, because of these clouds. Um, there's Natalie looking up and uh, beyond is, is, is steeper and more, and it gets harder and harder as you go, as you go up. Um, a magnificent finish, I must say. And the clouds lifted at that point, as you, as you could see. Um, and then the actual proper crux um, is this final chimney, um, which, uh, which was good fun, I must say, uh, in big boots. But we, we hauled ourselves up that uh, and to the top. And the beauty, of, again, of this is that you can find yourself back at the Almagella hut quite quickly. Um, which is which is there and, and close to that there's some some other great routes um, and uh, you know a celebration sausage uh, in the hut and a few beers of course. The other route uh, I wanted to talk about briefly also close to SAS um, is is this 
uh, map showing the the Yegi Grats. Now this um, this you can approach uh, from the Weissmies hut, which is at the bottom of your screens, um, and uh, you can see there the Yegi Horn and the Yegi Turm. And basically, uh, we accessed the, the 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 ridge close to that red arrow, turned left, went along the ridge, and then rather than going up the Yegi Horn, we actually came down the Via Ferrata, which is marked uh, Klettersteig there and back to the hut. A fantastic outing, which I, I, I did with a, a great friend and, and climbing partner of mine, Nigel Bassam. Um, and so we headed up to, to the Weissmies hut um, and uh, there'd been quite a bit of fresh snow actually the, the night before, which was maybe why we weren't in the sort of higher mountains. Behind us here, you can see all the, the main peaks of Sass. Behind Nigel's head is the Alphubel, and to the right, the Dorm and the Lenchspitzer, and to the left, the Alalinhorn and the Rimpfischhorn. Um, um, there, fantastic stuff. So we popped into the hut, the the uh, the Weissmies hut, to ask the guardian, "Do we need our crampons and axes?" Because because of this this fresh snow up on the ridge. But he said no, and so we left those in the hut. Um, and of course, the next job was to find out where this grand gendarme is that we wanted to use to access. The, the ridge, not, a, not that easy to find actually, initially. It's the sort of triangle that you can see on the right. And the plan, as I say, was to traverse the, go along the ridge and then back down the Via Ferrata. On the left is the Yegi Turm, which has some wonderful uh, bolted routes up, up, up its face, um, which are really worthwhile objectives as well. This, uh, this picture shows, uh, the, the arrow shows where we started. And the green arrow shows the red arrow, sorry. And the green arrow sh shows the Grand Gendarme. So the plan was to to sort of follow that, that roughly that direction. Um, and as you can see, the snow, that fresh snow, was still um, still very much in evidence. Um, when we got onto the start of the route, uh, we were pleased to to find that the snow had gone. Um, but unfortunately, underneath it was this uh, was this green moss uh, which was actually incredibly slippery so um, when we got to this point I think this is pretty much the first pitch um, uh, at this point Nigel s said to me um, Nick I think I'm going to fall off uh, and it, it doesn't look that, e that, that difficult because you know he's only at sort of probably 45 degrees maybe a bit more but it looks um, but there are no holds and, and he was really just sort of squirming his way up this thing uh, which was quite fun anyway he, I, I told him my response when he said that was, uh, don't fall off, please. Uh, and he did as he was told and uh, on we went. So that's looking back down to Nigel. Um, and as we got higher, uh, the, obviously things dried out and the rock was much, was much sort of redder anyway, which, uh, which and less moss. Quite a goey corner that we had to, to, to get through. I was glad Nigel led that bit. Um, and then, again, a view looking looking down onto me, which which shows how it sort of gradually gets steeper and steeper as you get up this Grand Gendarme. Um, I do love that photo. You can see the, the the fresh snow still there on the on the north side, just just close to me. Sorry, to Nigel. Nigel took that photo. You get as you get higher, you you have to sort of do a right turn to avoid the overhangs that are above Nigel's head. Um, there's a nice belay there, which we actually found with some difficulty. Um, and you can see the hut below in the clouds as well in that picture. And then from there, you then, you then again, you, you sort of branch pretty steeply up. Um, doesn't look very likely, but, but um, um, steeply up and you get to the top of the Grand Gendarme. That's a beautiful, beautiful climb, I must say. You then abseil off the back of that. And, um, and then, you know, we thought, oh, we've probably got the hardest bit done but the, 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 I must say the ridge itself took a long time so uh, there aren't many photos you'd be pleased to hear um, but uh, there was just lots of this beautiful beautiful stuff wonderful exposed climbing uh, the weather held and uh, I was with a you know a great climbing partner so it was a really great day uh, this is pretty much coming towards the end uh, again that shows the the ambience and the the exposure Behind Nigel's head, you can see the Fletchhorn and, and the Lagginhorn to the right, um, both of which uh, 
um, you know, great adventures as well, of course. And you could perhaps sense the relief in Nigel's uh, uh, sort of posture there. We were very happy to, to sort of turn a corner and, and find that we were on easy ground and um, had finished. Wonderful route, I must say. And then, as I say, you get, you come along, it's an easy walk uh, to the top of the Via Ferrata and you just sort of lower your, yourself down this steep Via Ferrata back to the hut and for a, a celebratory uh, drink. Um, so I really wanted to share those two, um, two routes with you. Um, fantastic routes, I must say, which I really recommend. Um, I discovered last night as I was uh, surfing about that, that both the Grand Gendarme and the Lago Maggiore routes were first climbed pretty much within weeks of each other in 1947 by members of the Zurbriggen family. So I have some more re research to do on what else they got up to, I must say. And if anybody knows more about them, uh, please do chip in at the end. Thanks too to uh, Natalie and Nigel for helping to make those uh, outings so memorable. And I recommend everyone, please come to SAS. Uh, you'll love it. Finally tonight, uh, we're joined by Richard Ive, who's also uh, a fellow rock member as well as myself. The West Ridge of the Salbitchen is regarded as one of the longest, hardest and finest ridge climbs in the whole of the Alps. With 34 pitches and more than 1,000 metres of climbing, the route links five huge consecutive granite towers along a ridge up to the sensational final summit tower and needle. Richard joined the Alpine Club in 2016. Like myself, he's also, oh, I've, I've already said that, away from the Alps, he's training to be a barrister in London. Richard's joining us from the Thames Valley in Berkshire, uh, and I hope he doesn't uh, talk as fast as he climbs, I must say. Over to you, Richard. Yeah, thanks very much for that introduction, Nick. Uh, as Nick said, I'm Richard Ive. Good evening, everyone, um, including to those of you joining us from the Felon Rock and on YouTube. I'm delighted to be uh, here, albeit remotely, tonight. I climbed the West Ridge of the Salbitchen in August of last year with my good friend, Ed Walker. Uh, at this point, I should thank Ed for allowing me to, to kindly use some of his photos. The West Ridge was originally climbed over the course of three and a half days in 1948. Now, most teams try to tackle it in just one. That was our aim. I want to start by sharing with you a video courtesy of my friend Dave Linnett. This video footage was shot um, on a, by him on a different trip back in 2015, but it beautifully, um, in the first minute or so, sets the scene. So here we go. Hopefully that wonderful bit of video gives you some sense of what's to come. After listening to this talk, I would highly recommend checking out Dave Linnett's Bald Eagles YouTube channel where you can find many more beautiful and inspiring adventurous climbing films. The Salbitchen, with a summit of 2,981 metres, is a mountain in the Erna Alps overlooking Geschenen. It lies about 75 miles south of Zurich and about 50 miles northeast of Visp. Visp was the meeting point for Ed and me, as I was in that part of the Alps at the time. Ed, who could only manage a couple of days off work, flew out for a long weekend. I met him at 1am on Friday the 1st of August at Visp train station. 
uh, less than 24 hours earlier, I'd risen at 4 a.m. to, rather fittingly, climb Nick's route on the Jägergram. Ed and I camped in the Sass Valley that evening and awoke to rain the next morning. The rain, however, did nothing to dampen our enthusiasm and excitement. In, in fact, in many ways, it gave us the opportunity to plan the next few days. The drive from uh, Visp, the Sass Valley, from where we were staying, to Geshen and, over the, and up and over the Furka Pass was very dramatic. Uh, that evening, we pitched up in a valley campsite and enjoyed an excellent night's sleep. We dreamed of this. The Saubitchen has three ridges. This photo of Dave's shows the east ridge on the right hand side of the photo and the south ridge on the left. The south ridge is served by the beautifully positioned Salbit Hut. This photo was taken from the terrace of the Salbit Hut, from the car park, the one where the bulls and cows can't trample your uh, car while you're climbing. Uh, there is 900 metres of ascent to the hut. We're looking back down to the valley that Ed and I have walked up from with other mountains in the Erna Alps looking back towards us. After a cheese and bread stop, we walked on to our home for the night, the Westridge Bivy Hut. On the right of the photo, you can see the point at which the path to the Bivy Hut crosses the grassy shoulder. Not long after that, an impressive swinging bridge marks the way over an enormous ravine. From there, it's not too far to the Bivy Hut itself. So here we can see our accommodation for the night, the Bivy Hut at the base of the West Ridge with Ed relaxing outside. The afternoon before the climb, we ate lots, uh, mainly cheese and bread, but a, a bit of couscous was thrown in for good measure. Uh, did a, we did a bit of bolted climbing on a nearby route to get a feel for the rock. And we tried our very best to dodge questions about British politics that were thrown at us by passing European walkers. Note the small 20 litre rucksack on the right of the photo. That's all we took between us. We knew that to complete the West Ridge in a day, we would need to be fast. Going lightweight was going to be key. A team of three wearing massive rucksacks decided to ram that message home as we watched them struggle up Tower One at the beginning of what they hoped would be a two day ascent. You can see a, a quite a large drop to the right of the photo. That's where the door to the Bivy Hut is. Ed and I made a, a mental note not to walk over the edge if we got up to go for a pee in the night. Although the hut is very comfortable, neither of us could sleep. We were just far too excited. The next morning, the alarm went off at 5 a.m. We were out the door at 5.25 and climbing by 5.30. Given that the ridge is conveniently only a five minute walk uphill from the hut, as can be seen on this map point, uh, with the arrow pointing towards the Bivy Hut. As Nick mentioned in his introduction, the route is 34 pitches. Leading 17 each seemed about right. Egg got us underway. From there, we swung leads after every pitch. Despite starting climbing in the, in the dark, the sun was soon up. It wasn't long till we were presented with magnificent views towards the South Ridge, a 17 pitch stiffy sill that can be seen on the right of the photo. Here is a photo taken by my friend Will Koenig on a different day that shows the South Ridge encased in swirling mist. Having dispatched the first seven pitches in about two and a half hours, Ed and I found ourselves on the top of the first tower. We were flying along, and the views were simply breathtaking. Two abseils, a short 12 metre one, and a longer 20 metre one, found us at the base of the second tower. At this point, we caught up with the three heavily laden climbers that we had watched climbing with their massive rucksacks the previous afternoon. In the time that it had taken us to climb seven pitches and complete two abseils, they had managed just two abseils. Knowing as they did that we had started from the Bivy Hut that morning, it would be fair to say that they weren't best pleased to see us. It was my turn to lead. 
and when the leader of the team of three was about 15 minutes up, I set off. It looks as if I could follow a crack to the right of the main one. If I can make light work of that, an efficient overtake could be executed. The climbing was delightful, and thankfully, the plan worked. Ed followed me swiftly up from where he attacked the notorious 45 meter 6A off width on Tower 2. He flew up, reveling and jamming parts of his body in here, there and everywhere. Reaching the top of this pitch marked the end of the real difficulties on Tower 2. Looking back to Tower 1, we felt as if we were making good progress but there was still an awfully long way to go. As you can see, even from Tower 2, by which point you have climbed 12 pitches and undertaken two abseils, the summit pinnacle still looks a very, very long way off. To commence Tower 3, we had to abseil off Tower 2. If you look closely, you can see what looks like a small crack on Tower 4. That, in fact, is a human-sized chimney. Inside it, there's a climber, a tiny dot in the photo, and they're about to start climbing. Here is a photo taken by Dave showing a climber abseiling off Tower 2. Here I am enjoying myself on Tower 3. Having made good time to this point, we stop for a bite of lunch. From here, we could see the three heavily laden climbers on top of Tower 2, which has the massive block on top. If you look closely, you can see one of the climbers circled in red. They stopped for a long time and started abseiling off the ridge, having decided that sadly, they were just too far behind schedule. It should be noted that the second tower is the most obvious place to abandon the West Ridge. This photo of Dave's taken from the South Ridge clearly shows the first four towers. After lunch, Ed and I had uh, many hours of climbing fun still ahead. Here's a photo of Ed dancing his way up Tower 4. Um, I have to say he seems to be managing pretty well without the selfie stick. Dave's photo, taken again from the South Ridge, provides a very different perspective on Tower 4. Here, circled in red, you can see a climber perched on top. This photo is taken many, many hours later as we were nearing the summit. Looking back along the ridge, you get a far better sense of how much up and down there really is. Dave's photo taken from the South Ridge illustrates this point really clearly. On the final tower, there is one particularly memorable pitch, the infamous 50 meter slab pitch, which finishes with exposed ridge climbing that is hard to protect. It was Ed's lead, and he dispatched it with panache. The final pitch, number 34, was mine to lead. The end was in sight, and then there it was, the summit bastion. At 7.30 p.m., exactly 14 hours after we'd set off climbing, we had reached the summit. Our timings had worked, we'd done it. A wave of euphoria engulfed us both. The following photo shows me conjuring up the carriage to stand on top of the to stand on top of the bastion. With enormous grins on our faces, we patted each other on the back and signed the summit book. Following that, we took a moment to take in the view and capture it with some photos. Here is one of Ed with the summit pinnacle in the background. It was then my turn for a quick photo. We had arrived on the summit at the same time as some Italian climbers. They helped us capture the moment. We were under no illusions that we had just come to the end of one of the longest and grandest days of rock climbing that we shall ever carry out. But we still needed to descend. At 8.10 p.m. we started the first of our nine abseils back to the Bibby Hut. Owing to the fading light, the last four of these, including two over a small snowfield, were undertaken in the dark. We returned to the hut at 11.30 p.m. to be greeted by another climber who offered us a warm drink. We politely accepted that sleep was what we most eagerly sought. Tired but ecstatically happy, we drifted off to sleep. We agreed that the West Ridge 
have been a sensational climb, one of life's truly wonderful experiences. It is the strength of the team and, and not that of the individual that carries the day. So I would like to thank Ed for all the energy, skill and enthusiasm that he injected. As a footnote, I should add that not much more than 24 hours later, Ed was back at work in Exeter. It was true. It really had been an exceptional weekend. 34 pitches, over a thousand metres of climbing up to, E2 difficult, up to E2 in difficulty and an overall grade of ED1. There's a reason why the rest, West Ridge is regarded as one of the longest, hardest and finest ridge climbs in the whole of the Alps. So there you have it. If you have a long weekend spare, why not climb the incredible West Ridge of the Sao Bichin? Uh, thank you all very much for listening and I'll pass now back to UNIT. Thank you, Richard. Really enjoyed that. Fantastic. And thanks too to Nick. Richard, um, what do you think the Alpine Club might do uh, to encourage more young, strong climbers such as yourself to join? Yeah, well, that, that's a very good question, Nick. I think having meets which are aimed at or are going to have lots of young climbers on is going to be really important because um, young climbers who want to do ambitious things want to go on a meet and know that there are going to be other people on that meet who are also young, a similar age, and, and want to do um, a similar sort of things. So I think that, that's crucial. Brilliant. Thank you. We'll take that on board. Um, great. So we've got some questions coming in. Um, Andy Wigley, uh, do, do you want to go ahead? I should be able to unmute you. Yes, thanks, Nick. Yeah, was, um, thanks for those talks. They're all awesome, really great adventures and really great to hear about them. I just wanted a question for you, Nick, and for anyone about footwear for these. Um, I'm pleased to say I've done the South Ridge of the Salvage, which is awesome as well. And I seem to remember, and we did the super salvage, in which is a you do a few pitches of six eight to start, and then there's so it's twenty three pitches. I remember wearing rock shoes all day, and you commented about wearing big boots. I just wondered what your thoughts were about the choices for this uh, for these kind of things. Yeah, well, um, um, thanks, Andy. Uh, it's a great question because actually I wanted to ask Richard a similar question. Um, we for for both the routes I did, we 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 wore big boots. Uh, it was just a kind of um, I suppose you look at the hardest pitch and you think, can I, can I hold myself up that? Uh, and I think the answer was, was yes. Uh, so, so we managed it, but um, um, I must say, I mean, the, that slimy pitch at the bottom of the, the Grand Gendarme, uh, I don't think rock boots would have made any difference. It was just a, a squirm. <laughs> um, Richard, do you want to carry on? I was wondering whether you wore rock boots. Uh, yes, we, we definitely wore rock boots on the, the West Ridge of the South Beach. And, uh, I've also, Andy, done the South Ridge and, and wore rock boots for those. Um, we, we just carried very light trainers on the back of our harnesses so that when we finished the abseils, we could sort of um, drop back to the hut. So it gives your, gives your feet a rest. So you, yeah, absolutely. Very sensible. <laughs> Great. Thanks for your question, Andy. Um, next, um, Zoe, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I've got a quick question um, for Richard. Well, first of all, thanks everyone. Really interesting talks and great sort of get some inspiration for the Alps this summer. And um, Richard, I was really interested to know, obviously you were trying to keep really lightweight. What gear did you take with you? I mean, is it, I mean, I know from some of these other routes, some of them are partially bolted anyway. So how did you sort of decide what to take, what to leave behind? What yes. did you guys do? Sure. So um, I, I took up a 37 litre rucksack to the mm. Bibby Hut. At the bottom of that, I had stuffed the 20 litre one, which, which basically stuffs down to nothing. Um, and then between us, we had two 250 metre halves. Mm. Uh, in terms of the rack, we knew it was on granite and very good granite. So we took yeah, cams yeah. Um, right. because they're much quicker than than getting nuts in and out, both in terms of placing and retrieving. I think there was one spot where I couldn't get a cam and I placed one wire in the hole of 34 pitches. Um, but we took about 10 cams. There were, there are some bolts. The belays yeah, themselves yeah. are bolted. So that, that helps and speed things, speeds things up. But on yeah, a lot yeah. of the pitches, you are placing cams. 
Um, and it is up to E2, isn't it? So yeah, you, I'll, I'll, you do I'll, want I'll, to be protected, yeah. Yeah, you do want to be protected, exactly. Um, up to E2. The main, the main thing that was heavy that we took was water. So I think we took, because you're on a ridge, two litres each. Um, but in the similar vein to eating lots the day before, we sort of camelled, if you like, and had lots of water. Um, and Are there any points partway on the route where you could... I mean, did you find any, I know it sounds strange, but any patches of snow or were there any points where you think you could have filled up some water? Um, no, 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 no. We had to carry right. the only water we could access was the water we had with us. So right. that was a key thing. And then yeah. most of the other weight was taken up actually with the food we had. And we worked out very precisely what we're going to take, mainly lots of bars. Um, and then beyond that, a knife, uh, a few first aid things, and then... I think there was probably only one change of layer. I think I had a very lightweight fleece, which I started the day in and finished the day in and everything yeah. was the same. And then we had sort of one more spare, spare layer that whoever was be laying or waiting to abseil mm -hmm. could use. No, that's brilliant. It sounds like it, it sounds like an amazing day out. <laughs> oh, I, I, and sorry, the other thing I should just add is um, there are lots of blankets in the bivy hut, so there's not a need to take a sleeping bag which makes Brilliant. it easy to take a smaller bag up to the Bivy Hut as well. And is the hut free or is it one where you've got to give a voluntary donation? Um, it's not, there's not a guardian, uh, but they do ask for a, a donation. It, it wasn't very much, but we, we put some money in the box as, as far as I can recall. Brilliant. No, thank you. Yeah, it no sounds worries. like it's really well. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks, Zoe. And of course, I imagine you, you didn't forget the champagne, Richard. <laughs> well, that, that's right. Four litres of water plus champagne, Nick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mike, do you want to go ahead? Mike Eston's got a question. Yeah, a question or a question and comment really to Nick Simmons about the um, Miroir de l'Argentine, which is an old stomping ground of mine. Um, I was firstly uh, gobsmacked really to hear him say, did I get it right, that on the ordinary route there's pegs that uh, it's bolted at five to six metre intervals. Um, we, we did it in big boots, of course, in the day, in, in 1970, at, my God, 50 years ago. Um, and we did the, uh, the left-hand branch of the Y, the, the ordinary route, so-called, and the direct route. And there wasn't a bolt, peg, or anything to be seen. I mean, it's, it's just amazing, the change uh, that you get nowadays in that part of the world. Um, a further comment, actually, uh, it's probably worthwhile mentioning that, uh, as I'm sure you know, that that part of the world was explored by the Remy brothers, uh, wrote a large part of the guidebook. Um, the Remy brothers, uh, Claude and Eve, were taken to the hills by their father, Marcel, who just recently, I don't know if you've seen the film that uh, the Mammoth have put up on the web, um, but uh, he's recently done a sort of combination of the ordinary route. Their father has recently done a combination of the ordinary route and the direct route at the age of 94. Uh, <laughs> quite, a, quite an experience. Um, a, um, a good message for all of us, perhaps, to keep on. Yeah. Thanks for the super talk, Nick. It's, a, it's an incredible film. Um, but because of his age, he, he bivvies at the foot of the route the night before, doesn't he? So he can get yeah, straight right. into the climbing. Uh, and it must be the umpteenth time that he's been on the miroir. And as you say, it's a, it's a hybrid of the normal and the direct, isn't it? Yeah. And he just romps up it at the age of 94. It's absolutely incredible. <laughs> and both the Remy brothers are with him and, and a couple of others in support, aren't they? Um, yeah. Anybody who hasn't seen that, uh, definitely uh, Google Marcel Remy miroir. And you'll find this cracking film. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike and Nick. Um, let's go to Nigel. Nigel has, um, Nigel's following the YouTube chat. So I, I think there, there are some questions coming in from the YouTube. Yeah, I've got a question for Richard from Joe, who says, um, did taking such a small rucksack feel like a gamble as mountaineering decisions go? for such an adventurous route with so many pitches, was there much fixed gear? Um, no, I don't think it did feel like a gamble because we'd worked out exactly what we needed. Um, you don't want to carry, you want to carry the right amount of water, 
not too little, not too much. And we, we sort of got that right. And the same with food. Um, you want to choose a day where the forecast is pretty much saying it's not going to rain. So you know you're going to be climbing in a t-shirt, uh, probably with a cap. Um, so all then you need to do is have something light when you're starting off in the dark, um, another layer and also later in the day. Um, and in terms of there being much fixed gear, I'd probably reiterate some of what I said in answer to Zuri's question, which is um, there, are, there are quite a few bolted belays, but there are lots of pitches where you don't, you only have one or two bolts in, in 50 meters. So uh, we're placing, placing cams in particular all the time. Thank you for the question. Um, Richard Naden, go ahead, Richard. Hello. <laughs> Hello good evening. I, I've just been in contact with a very good friend of mine who runs a hut in um, the Paradiso. And uh, just as a passing comment, she's removed all her blankets from the hut as such. So when you visit a hut now, most likely you will have to take a sleeping bag with a liner now as such. Um, as an addenda to that, um, I wanted to comment about uh, Richard's uh, preparation for the, uh, the route that he did, is about all the little shortcuts that you can make on a big route like this mm -hmm. make such a difference to the exchange of climbing um, when you're sort of like exchanging gear on belays and all the rest of it. So making that really efficient is, is really worthwhile as well too, as, as Richard will appreciate, of course. Yeah, I, I think um, for anyone who thinks you're doing it, you want to try, if you can, to work out a schedule. So uh, we knew we had 34 pitches, which means that as an average, you've got to do each pitch, which means go from start to finish and then be start on the next pitch in about 25 minutes. Exactly. And that's excluding, excluding the fact that you've got the abseils. So we said for the fast pitches, we try and do them in about 15 minutes. That's between us. And we can't really take any longer than half an hour. But in terms of those gains, um, just to give you an idea of the, the extent to which you're trying to really get off to, to a flying start, particularly on the first tower, we actually walked up and, and left, um, left our harnesses with all the gear on and um, at the start of the climb. So we weren't even having to lug that up the hill, just all, all those things to try and reduce the amount of energy we're using and make it as, as efficient as possible. Well, it just shows um, such a level of preparation, Richard, uh, which is the antithesis to your, um, um, you know, belaboured um, sack haulers who were trying to follow behind as such, you know, and that's it. You know, we've all witnessed sort of like Brits like ourselves, you know, in the, at the start of our climbing careers, overladen with gear and all the rest. It's a fine judgment, we know, but, you know, it's, it's a real art learning that uh, balance as such, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is absolutely. And, and seeing the other climbers who I alluded to twice, um, it's sort of really rammed home that the proverb or the old adage that if you plan to be able to stay for a second night or to take two days, then that's how, how long you end up taking. Um, because absolutely. quite a lot of climbing is quite steep and if you're hanging off your arms, you'd, you'd really feel that extra weight on, on your back. Um, and it's not just the time it takes, it's the enjoyment that, um, you know, there's that great photo of Ed uh, without a selfie doing a selfie, uh, so without the selfie stick doing the selfie. Um, and that was in, in great contrast to really three pretty downtrodden people who have big boots hanging off the, the backs of their harnesses with, mm. with 40 litre rucksacks. So it's not just the time it takes, but also the enjoyment as well, which has got to be a big, big part of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both Richards. Mm. Uh, it's good to see you, Richard. Um, I've got a question for Nick. Nick Simons, actually, myself. Um, having spent some time, obviously, family time in Switzerland yourself, and, and then being a member of the Swiss Alpine Club, uh, I, I know from personal experience uh, that this gives you power to make an excellent um, um, fondue. Can you tell me your secret? <laughs> uh, I, w I wish I was being asked a climbing question. <laughs> um, uh, you want to get two cheeses, uh, an Emmental and a Gruyere. Uh, don't be fooled into buying the factory Emmental. Make sure you get a nice one and a nice Gruyere. You need about 200 grams per person 
and about 100 mils of dry white wine per person. Rub the pan with a garlic clove that you've halved. Uh, get some a little bit of corn flour mixed in with your grated cheese and some nutmeg. Uh, slowly melt it. Bosh. Fantastic. You can't go wrong with a bit of nutmeg. I, I, I put it in my mashed potatoes. It's great. <laughs> Just want to say thank you. It's really good of uh, you, Richard and Nick, to, to give your time. Thanks for, for bearing with us with the technical rehearsals. Um, and I've got something I, I want to share with you before I tell you about next week. I've got some serious news to share with you, actually, which is close to my heart from Andrew Vilikovsky. Andrew's the fount of knowledge for all things climbing related in East Africa besides having a great many first ascents there himself. Richard Naden and I had the great fortune to go to Mount Kenya with him last year. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to the AC about the disaster which has struck the ruined Zori. Between the steamy expanses of the Congo jungles and Lake Victoria lie the ruined Zori Mountains, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Shrouded in mists, early travellers often never saw their summits. Dense vegetation, steep-sided valleys, bogs, raging torrents and finely glaciers further guarded access to their icy summit. Kilembe village, pictured here, grew up around a cobalt and copper mine. John Hunnick was an agricultural lecturer who, on retiring, bought a ruined house in post Amin, Kampala, which he converted into a budget hostel for backpackers. After a period of working for orphans in Rwanda, he was beaten up for bringing Hutu as well as Tutsi children to the orphanage. He was forced to leave. He returned to Uganda and the Ruanzori to open up the Kilembe route. John has for years trained locals as guides, developed tourist services including building camps, bridges and trails. In May 2020, some of the heaviest rains on record hit the ruined Zori and huge floods roared down the valleys. Bridges were swept away, as were schools, a hospital and many houses. Tourism is essential for the survival of many families here and the rebuilding the tourism infrastructure is part of the essential work to be done to restore life to these communities. Money donated will be used by him with the blessing of the Uganda Wildlife Authority to buy building materials and food and to employ locals to rebuild the facilities destroyed by the floods. If you do feel able to make a contribution, we're putting a link to a Just Giving page into the chat on Zoom and YouTube and onto social media. Next week's Alpine Clubcast number 14 is the second in our double bill entitled The Six Great North Faces. The Rucksack Club and Alpine Club, two of Britain's oldest mountaineering clubs, are combining over two episodes to take you up the classic tick list of six great North Faces of the Alps, with accounts from members of each club. Next week is hosted by the Alpine Club and will be on the Drew, the Chima Grande and the Badil with speakers James Thacker, Dominic Alton and Ian Bryant. Do have a look at the Alpine Club Library YouTube page where you can watch, like and share all the previous Alpine Club casts. Thanks all for joining us. Keep safe, keep active and keep alert. <laughs>